Welcome to the DaVinci Academy Histology video course. The entire video course is available on YouTube and covers all of the fundamental principles of histology and relevant cell biology. You can find all of the videos from the course by clicking the histology playlist link in the description below, and then you can access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos by going to our website, which is also linked in the description below. In this second part of the Endocrine System Lecture Series, we'll discuss the anatomy, histology, and function of the pineal gland, the thyroid, the parathyroid, and the adrenal glands. The pineal gland is a small ovoid organ that extends out from the epidalamus. So similar to the posterior pituitary, the pineal gland is an extension of the epithalamic neural tissue and is comprised of numerous neurons, which are specifically called the pinealocytes, that synthesize and secrete melatonin. And here, the neuron cell bodies are physically located and are isolated to the epithalamus. Melatonin Melatonin is an important hormone involved in the regulation of our circadian rhythm. The neurons are, of course, supported by the glial cells, which are modified astrocytes within the pineal gland, and they form the stromal components. Another thing that we can see from a really macroscopic view of this organ are these dark and irregularly positioned and sized structures that are strewn throughout. These are called the corpora aranesia, which is also called the brain sand. Now, we have no idea what their functions are, but we tend to accumulate these calcified concretions within the parenchyma of the pineal gland over time. At a higher magnification of the boxed area, we can once again appreciate the cellular nature, but also the tissue composition that is reminiscent of the neural tissue. Many of these larger neurons belong to the pinealocytes, the ones that are actually producing the melatonin, and smaller and more oval nuclei belong to the astrocytes or the glial cells in the pineal glands. And these brown to black irregularly shaped and sized structures are the corpora aranesia. The thyroid gland is this butterfly-shaped organ that sits just below the larynx, which is right here, and in front of the trachea. This fleshy and delicate organ is comprised of the two types of endocrine cells. And in this histological view of the thyroid, we can appreciate that these endocrine cells are forming these spherical secretory units called the follicles. And primarily, it's one type of endocrine cells that are forming these follicles. So we call these cells the follicular cells. So majority of these nuclei of the cells that are lining the follicles would be the follicular cells. And they produce and store this eosinophilic amorphous structure in the middle called the colloid, which is kind of a jelly-like substance. And within this matrix, the follicular cells store iodide and other molecules with which they can synthesize the thyroid hormones. Not quite as numerous as the follicular cells are the parafollicular cells, also called the C-cells. These are more pale staining, sometimes individual or sometimes groups of cells that are either wedged in between the follicles or are integrated within the follicular lining as small populations of cells. And these are the cells that produce calcitonin, which regulates the bone tissue and the blood calcium level. At a higher magnification of one of these regions of the thyroid, we can appreciate the follicular cells that are lining the follicles with a colloid in the middle. And this one just seems to have dried out and shrunken away from the follicular cells. So a lot of these non-staining circular structures are all just artifacts. At any rate, in between the follicles, we see these aggregates of pale staining cells. These would be the collections of the parafollicular cells. And sometimes these parafollicular cells can be a component of the follicular lining, but they still retain their pale staining nature. The thyroid hormones play an incredibly important role in regulating our metabolism, our temperature regulation, and even our cognitive processing power. 
The parathyroid glands are small and ovoid fleshy structures that sit on the posterior aspect of the thyroid. They'd be located kind of right around here on this side. So from the posterior perspective, we should be able to see about four or so of these parathyroid glands, small structures on the posterior aspect of the thyroid. The parathyroid glands are epithelial tissue derived, so they're very cellular. Histologically, in this low mag image, we can appreciate that intimate anatomic relation between the thyroid gland anteriorly and the parathyroid gland posteriorly. You can see a lot of these thyroid colloid filled follicles. So this is the thyroid. And on the posterior aspect, this more cellular structure is the parathyroid. Also of note, with age, it is not uncommon to accumulate some of these unilocular adipocytes within the parenchyma. So this is actually a typical parathyroid histology. In terms of the endocrine cells that comprise the parathyroid, there are also two types here. One is called the principal cells, also called the chief cells. Not to be confused with the chief cells of the stomach glands, by the way. The principal or the chief cells of the parathyroid gland secrete parathyroid hormone, or PTH, which regulates the bone tissue mineralization and has an effect in increasing blood calcium level. At a higher magnification of the box area, the principal cells are these regularly shaped and sized circular cells with pale to basophilic staining cytoplasm. The other type of endocrine cells in the parathyroid are the oxyphil cells. These are these slightly larger cells with eosinophilic staining cytoplasm. These oxyphil cells can be present as a single cell or aggregate of cells as seen such. And to this date, we're not quite sure as to what their functions are in the parathyroid, although some suggest that the oxyphil cells could be the stem cells that give rise to the principal cells, or these used to be the principal cells that are kind of taking a little break. And again, some of the unilocular adipocytes can be appreciated in this field of view as well. So that's parathyroid gland. The adrenal glands are these wedge-shaped fleshy organs that sit on top of each kidney on the right and left side. They're invested within and are protected by a lot of fatty tissues, which we call the perinephric fat. Histologically, the adrenal glands are divided into the outer layer, the cortex, and the inner layer, which is the medulla. Outside of that, we have a thin layer of dense irregular connective tissue forming a nice little capsule. And outside of that, we're seeing this fatty layer. Even from this low magnification image, the cortical layer appears as if there are three subregions that have slightly different staining patterns. These are indicative of the different functions and the hormonal products that are released by these three zones or sublayers. The adrenal medulla, which has its own staining pattern, also produces a different type of hormone as well. So a total of four different hormones are being released by the adrenal glands. First, looking at the three sublayers of the cortex going from outside to inside at a higher magnification just under the capsule we have a layer called the zona glomerulosa of small endocrine cells that are organized into spherical or ovoid organizations this layer produces and secretes a family of hormones called the mineralocorticoids of which the most prominent example is the aldosterone Aldosterone's target organ is in the kidneys, the distal convoluted tubules. In response to aldosterone stimuli, the distal convoluted tubules of the kidneys will increase the resorption of sodium back into the body, with which the water would follow, thereby we're able to retain the water within our body and to increase the blood pressure and volume. 
deep to the zona glomerulosa and taking up about 70 to 80 percent of the thickness of the adrenal cortex is the zona fasciculata where the endocrine cells are typically organized into these fascicles or, or nice even rows of cells or cords of cells. The endocrine cells of the zona fasciculata secrete a family of hormones called the glucocorticoids of which the most prominent example would be the cortisol, also commonly known as the stress hormone. This cortisol has many different functions with many different target cells around the body, but its general effect is the increase in gluconeogenesis and changes in fat metabolism, as well as suppression of the inflammatory reactions around the body. The deepest layer of the adrenal cortex is called the zona reticularis. Here, the endocrine cells are once again smaller, and these cells form little cords that overall form a bit of a fishnet-like network. So reticularis or reticulata refers to a network, which is indicative of this histological observation. Here, the endocrine cells produce a family of hormones called the gonadocorticoids, of which DHEA is is the most prominent example. It's a form of a sex hormone. The medulla of the adrenal gland actually has a different embryonic origin than the adrenal cortex, whereas the adrenal cortex comes from the epithelial tissue origin. The endocrine cells of the medulla are actually derived from the neural crest cell population and their derivatives, the chromaffin cells, which secrete the epinephron and norepinephron, collectively called the adrenaline function much more similar to the neuron cells as opposed to the epithelial-derived endocrine cells. So for this reason, the chromaffin cells are said to be functionally more similar to the postganglionic sympathetic neurons. To summarize the endocrine system and integrate it with the endocrinology and some physiology, let's look at the whole system one last time. The pineal gland, which is an extension of the epithalamus, is positioned on the posterior aspect of the diencephalon. It produces melatonin, which regulates our circadian rhythm. The pineal gland is an extension of the neural tissue, and its parenchymal cells are the pinealocytes, supported by the astrocytes. The pituitary gland is subdivided into the anterior lobe or the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary or posterior lobe. The posterior lobe is comprised of the neural tissue and it contains the extensions of the axons coming from the hypothalamic nuclei, the paraventricular and supraoptic to be a little more specific. And here the axon terminals dilate and become the herring body from which the oxytocin and vasopressin, also known as the ADH, are released. Oxytocin simulates lactation, uterine contraction, and the feeling of love. The vasopressin, or the ADH, causes the kidney collecting tubules to increase water absorption. The anterior pituitary, on the other hand, produces seven different hormones. The MSH, the melanocyte stimulating factor, so it goes and stimulates the melanocytes throughout the body to increase the pigment production. TSH stimulates the thyroid glands to increase the thyroid hormone secretion. The FS H and LH both have an effect on the testes and the ovaries by stimulating the follicles to grow in females and for the spermatogenesis to occur in male. And the luteinizing hormone in females will stimulate ovulation and in male it will stimulate the testosterone production from the testes. The ACTH stimulates the adrenal cortex, especially the zona fasciculata, to increase the production of cortisol. These five hormones are produced by the basophils. 
Now, when we hear basophils of the pituitary gland, these should be distinguished from the basophils of the peripheral blood. The basophils in the peripheral blood are a type of white blood cells that have a lot of basophilic granules in their cytoplasm containing histamine and prostaglandin type of inflammatory agents. The other two hormones are the GH, the growth factor, which has many, many different target cells and organs that stimulate metabolism and growth, and prolactin, which simulates the breast tissues and the mammary glands to, to grow and enlarge. These two hormones of the anterior pituitary are produced by the acidophils. The thyroid gland is comprised of two types of cell populations as well. The follicular cells produce the thyroid hormones T3 and T4, and the parafollicular cells, also known as the C-cells, produce calcitonin. The calcitonin, if you recall, has a direct inhibitory role on osteoclast, which can then decrease the blood calcium level. The parathyroid glands, which I'm drawing in right now, are usually about four or so small ovoid glands that sit on the posterior aspect of the thyroid. The parathyroid glands, too, have two types of cell populations. The principal cells, also known as the chief cells, produce parathyroid hormones, also called the PTH. The PTH has direct inhibitory role on the osteoblast, and in addition to directly inhibiting the osteoblast activities, it stimulates the osteoblasts to synthesize and secrete the osteoclast stimulating factor or hormone OSF, which then stimulates the osteoclasts, which then breaks down the bone tissue, thereby increasing the blood calcium level. The other type of cells in the parathyroid are the oxyphil cells, and at present we're not sure as to what their functions are. The adrenal glands have the cortical and medullary organization with the cortex being on the outside and the medulla being in the inside. The cortex comprised of the epithelial derived endocrine cells have three subregions. The outermost is called the zona glomerulosa. Here the mineral or corticoids such as the aldosterone is released, which stimulates the kidney's distal convoluted tubule cells to increase sodium resorption, thereby increasing water resorption, because water follows the salt, so we're able to increase blood volume and pressure. Deep to the zona glomerulosa, we have zona fasciculata, where the endocrine cells produce and release cortisol, the stress hormone. Here we need to make a link where the ACTH from the anterior pituitary stimulates the zona fasciculata and thereby increasing the cortisol level. Deep to the zona fasciculata, we have the zona reticularis, where we have the DHEA, a form of a sex hormone. Deep to the cortex, we have the medulla, which is comprised of the chromaffin cells, which are considered to be the modified postsynaptic sympathetic neurons. So they actually have direct input from sympathetic neural fibers, and in response, the chromaffin cells release the epinephron and norepinephron. Thank you for watching this video from the Da Vinci Academy Histology video course, which is completely available on YouTube. To access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos, go to our website using the link in the description below. Thank you.